When one reads Vatsayana's masterpiece, the Kama Sutra, one is immediately floored by how little the book really has to do with just sex. It actually pushes us to relook at the modern interpretation about the very act of love making. You see, Vatsayana is of the opinion that the act itself begins with the little things that make up simple courtship, such as having empathy towards the other and being considerate to one's feelings. Also, the other point to note is how the treatise looks at love making as being something luxurious, something to be relished. It's all high culture for sure, but some things just do not change. The human condition endures for millennia even. So do anxieties with regard to sexual games. One question was as much a source of anxiety then as it is today. Does size really matter? Or better yet, did size matter during the age of the Kama Sutra in ancient India? Well, the long and the short of it, the big and the small of it, is yes. You see, in the current context of contemporary culture, the onus of size is thrust upon the man or the active partner engaged in the act of penetration. Was this true during the age of Vatsayana? It probably was. But it is not stated so explicitly. Doing so would probably lower the standard of discourse adopted throughout the book. Also, the question of size is ambiguous. How big is too big? Or worse, how small is just not good enough? The Kama Sutra understood the anxiety associated with size and the envy of men among men. But the Kama Sutra was never so myopic. Humanistic sexual philosophers from that day and age recognized the variability in nature along with the relativity involved with complex measurements of human anatomy. What we have are zoological metaphors that act as classifications for different kinds of sizes seen in both genders. Men and women come in three sizes, each characterized by animals, depending on the respective sizes of the sexual organs. In the ascending order of size, men were classified as the hare, the bull, and the horse. And in the ascending order of size, women were classified as the deer or the doe, the mare, and the elephant cow. Now, it is always important to understand the subtext when it comes to ancient Sanskrit doctrines. There are three major interpretations possible here. The first one is, the mere need for such zoological classification means that size does matter, at least in one way or the other. Also, compatibility is the key. The second is, notice how this classification acknowledges the anxiety of men when it comes to their penis sizes by the sheer difference between the smallest and the average. Hairs are significantly smaller than bulls. This difference is highly skewed when compared with the difference between the average and the biggest. Bulls and horses have different sized members but if the action in the farms or the fields is anything to go by, both bring it. What the subtext can convey is that there are diminishing returns when it comes to size the bigger it gets. Anything above average will not significantly add too much to good sex or make it way better. But anything below average will significantly add to how bad the sex can potentially be. Below average is catastrophic for men in the games of sexual selection. Third interpretation is how the women's categories of sizes are significantly bigger than the respective male counterparts. The deer is bigger than the hare, the mare is bigger than the bull, and the elephant cow is massive when compared to the horse. This does not mean that the onus of size is on men, but that the onus of satisfying a mare is much larger for the bull than it is when it copulates with a deer. Perhaps this anxiety is the reason the Kama Sutra recommends certain sexual unions over others. They are classified as the high unions and the low unions. The high unions are the ones wherein the man engages in coitus with a woman who sized a step below within the corresponding size hierarchy matchup. What this means is that while the bull and the mare are perfectly compatible, the higher or more preferable union for a bull is the deer. And similarly, it is more suited that a horse goes for the mare. 
the highest union is that of the horse and the deer. On the other hand, the low unions are the ones wherein the woman engages in coitus with a man sized a step below her in the size hierarchy matchup. So, low unions for women would mean an elephant cow going for a bull or a mare going for a hare. Both are not preferable at all because within the worldview of the Kama Sutra, the primary goal of any act of love making is construed to favor the satisfaction of a woman's desire as opposed to that of a man's. The lowest union is that of the elephant cow going for a hare, which could be bad matchmaking at its best and a cuckold situation at its worst. The logic behind high and low sexual unions does seem to place the onus of satisfaction on a man if not anything else. Size does matter. It's not the motion of the ocean but the size of the wave? Okay. But the best surfing calls for both the size of the wave and the motion of the ocean. It's not the size of the wand but the magic in it? Fantastic. But it will always depend on how much a man can wing it with his own spell of Wingardium Leviosa. This is where different sexual positions come in of course. But Vatsayana limits their efficacy with subtle disclaimers like his advocacy for the simultaneous use of special ancient editions of dildos, ointments, creams for expanding orifices or even contracting them. After all, beyond a point, culture cannot accommodate nature. This is Culture Minus Sanskar. Thanks for watching.